First of all, an apology. When I first started giving presentations at conferences back around 2002, first few years I felt guilty if I repeated a talk. I felt bad about not giving each and every audience something genuinely original, the latest, greatest ideas in my mind. Uh, that was quite a high bar for oneself. You've got to have the original thought and then you've got to present it. But over time, I've come to feel the reverse. I feel really guilty when I give a presentation for the first time. Because when I've given a presentation before, I'm pretty good on the timing. I know how to keep on time. This morning, I could have actually been on time. I could have brought it in, but I made a mistake of knowing where the deadline was, okay? Yeah, I know when to speed up and slow down, I just do it. And I also have worked out all the jokes. I know where to put them in, I know when to pause, like a stand-up comedian. Um, and with a new presentation, I don't. This is a new presentation. You are the first people to see this. If it works, some more. If it works, some more people will see it. If it doesn't work, we'll bury it and pretend it didn't exist, right? Um, what I should have done is I should have put a great big question mark there. Because actually, this, is, this presentation is as much a question to you as it is me trying to tell you things. I have a hypothesis that the product owner role is almost impossible to fill well. And I would like your take on that. I would like to know what you think about that. So grab me afterwards, tweet me, email me, however you want to. Just, just give me your thoughts. Yes? No? So um, do we have any product owners in the audience tonight? Hey, get them up against the wall. <laughs> so, sorry, Pink wouldn't let me get away with that. Um, of the rest of you, who, hands up if you work with a product owner. Right. Keep your hands up if you think you really work with an excellent product owner, a product owner you would happily recommend to friends and family. Hey, that's pretty impressive. Okay, maybe my hypothesis is wrong. There are people out there who really think their product owner is doing a great job. Part of the motivation behind this presentation is when I think back among the product owners I have known, most of them were in some way flawed. It, it, I found it difficult to think, you know, it, they were really excellent product owners. She was fantastic. I've worked with some who were good. I've worked with lots that were bad. But when it comes to product owners I'd recommend, I really have to think hard. So maybe I'm wrong. Or maybe Sweden's just better at breeding good product owners. Um, so I, I, uh, a lot of these thoughts came together. So commercial plug, I have a new book out and I'd like you to buy it, The Art of Product Ownership, which was deliberately entitled, was deliberately not entitled uh, Product Owner. The word Product Owner is not in the title because I'm open to the argument that the activities a product owner does could be done by other people people we might call a business analyst, a product manager, or even a developer. And in my, um, in my wilder moments, I wonder whether, as an industry, the traditional roles of business analyst, who traditionally works before any development, and the traditional role of tester, which typically works after development has occurred, whether those two should and are swapping places particularly when you use a technique like behavior-driven development and you involve your testers early on. Testers are frequently working before the developers work. And as some of you heard me say this morning, we really should get into more evaluation of the things we deliver, the work we deliver, and that really is a business analysis role to go out and analyze and to evaluate whether the thing that we delivered whether it actually makes a difference to the business, whether it really does deliver the value we thought it was. So I suspect we're seeing those two roles reverse. Um, but part of that, I'm wondering whether the way we, and specifically our organizations, operate are setting our product owners up to fail. 
obviously not in Sweden, but perhaps elsewhere. Um, and my hypothesis is that the product owner is the most important role on the team, partly because there's usually one of them, and we have multiple developers and maybe multiple testers, but typically there's just one product owner, single point of failure, reliant on one person. Um, and partly because while we all love Scrum Masters, if you don't have a Scrum Master, your team kind of gets by. They may be inefficient, but they kind of get by. If you don't have a product owner, quite possibly you build the wrong thing. You completely go off track. So that's why I think they're the most important role. At the same time, um, I think the role is very difficult, perhaps impossible, to fill well because of the demands on the role. I've mentioned in Scrum there's only one. And I think many of our organizations ask too much of our product owners. Apart from that, there's a bit of confusion in some organizations whether the product owner is a requirements type person or whether the product owner is a delivery type manager. Is the product owner a business analyst type person trying to understand what we should build or are they a project manager type person cracking the whip and making sure people do what they're told. Um, and I don't think our organizations support product owners enough. They, if they're lucky, the product owner will get a couple of days product owner training, if they're lucky. Will they get, the, will they get training in business analysis, product manager, facilitation, and all the other skills they need? Um, so just, just for reference, when I talk about product owner, I'm, I'm really thinking of the way Scrum describes it. And be clear, product owner here, one person. Pretty clear, isn't it? One person responsible for managing and controlling the backlog. Product owner is one person, not a committee. Only one person. Single product backlog. Right. So whatever this is, we're asking for one person to do it. And there's, there's good reason why Scrum said one person. I'm sure some of you have worked in organizations where many people feel as if they can walk up to the development team and decibel management prevails. The louder they shout, the more likely they are to get what they want, and he who shouts loudest wins. Yeah. The other thing to mention in Scrum is um, it's a self-organizing team. It's a cross functional team. Those words also kind of imply, although it's not spelt out there, that it's an egalitarian team, a team of equals or at least peers. Self-organizing team chooses the best work rather than being directed by others outside the team. So we have our team. They're responsible. They're egalitarian. They're self-organizing. They're cross-functional. They are a team, except one person is authorized to tell them what to do. Uh, is there a contradiction here? Is this a contradiction we've been missing? I certainly know a team at the moment where it does create tension. The, the developers say, we are a self-organizing team. We decide what to do. Why should the product owner tell us what to do? What gives them the right to tell the coders what to do when it's a self-organizing team. They've got a point, haven't they? I, I don't know about your organizations, but at the very least, let's acknowledge that there is a potential conflict there. there. Within the few words of Scrum, it's saying two things that are open to interpretation. And while you and I and Jeff's, Jeff Sutherland may know the correct interpretation, other people may choose to interpret those words differently. So is there a conflict? Let's think about what the product manager or product owner does. Um, and our old friend, the triangle of constraints, the iron triangle, beloved by project managers everywhere. Uh, except I don't like it. You know me. Um, cost in our industry is people multiplied by time. You may, rent some serv you may rent some time off Amazon, you might buy a few laptops, you might invest in some software. That 
pales into insignificant compared to your salaries. And I think developers and testers in Sweden are paid as much as they are in the UK. No, you're paid more. We're a low-cost development center now. So I like this to be people time features. That's what we're trading off here. And we know, you've all been in Mike's talk this morning, reminded you of, and, and, um, and um, boy, you see, um, James Lewis just reminded you, Brooks Law, adding more people to a late project makes it later, which generalizes to adding people slows you down. So we've got the people we've got. We've got the, so we can't really add people. It takes time to add people and it slows us down. Time is kind of fixed. Remember those sprints? Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. You remember you have business deadlines? Yeah. Even if you work on a quarter basis, a quarter comes around like every 12 weeks. Time is pretty much fixed. Cost is fixed. Agile's all about flexing features. If you want the one difference between traditional development and agile is that in traditional development, we pretend for as long as possible that features is fixed. And we pretend we can get more money to buy more time and more people. Until such time as somebody says, no, you can't have more money, you can't have more time, you can't have more people, and then we flex features. In agile, we start from the reverse assumption. We're always going to flex features. Every planning meeting is a feature negotiation. Time is fixed. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, 14 days. Do I need to elaborate? You've got the people you've got, so we negotiate here. And this is the product owner's job. It's the product owner that needs to be thinking about the features and negotiating them all the time. It's our variable. So functionality, demand, what? We can say features, we can say requirements. None of these words are really quite adequate. I sometimes like to talk about the demand side, what people want. It's the thing we're going to build and the thing we're going to build next. So the product owner is all about the what. What's next? What's the thing after next? Not when, because the when is given. Two weeks, two weeks, two weeks. What should we build next? So there's our team. Requirements go in. Working software comes out. Do you remember the old um, film Chicken Run? Wallace and Gromit spin-off? Chickens go in, pies come out. Requirements go in, software comes out. Preferably working software. And um, it's the product owner's job to decide exactly what goes in. Because there's always more work you could do than you can do, than you have time for, than you have people for. Um, often, the product owner's background is as a subject matter expert. The product owner is somebody who has been working in this domain, this field, for years and years, and they know this inside out. And subject matter experts can be really great people to have as product owners because they really know the detail and they really understand the way people are working and the way the software is going to be used in real life. For the same reason, they can be bloody awful people to have as product owners because they are in the here and now. Yeah, they're all about doing the same thing faster and a little bit better. And if you really want to do something radically different, if you want to reinvent this thing, perhaps you want people who don't have that baggage. You want people who are going to come at it and almost be ignorant of some of the challenges. So subject matter experts can be product owners. And so can business analysts. Um, you often find this in large corporations. They don't know who to make product owner, so they get a business analyst. And business analysts are, by background and training, people who understand what users or customers or clients want from a technology product and help bring that need to the technology team. I think the natural home for business analysts is in a corporation, corporation in a tower block. Business analyst goes up and down in a lift all day and talks to all the potential users. Yeah, business analysts, their customers are in this building. Now, if you work for Accenture, you may also have business analysts, but your business analysts are like contracted to your client for the duration of that work. Great people to have. They know about stakeholders and they know about proxies. And then you have product managers. 
who are a lot like business analysts, product managers are about understanding what customers, specifically customers, want from a product and deciding what that should look like in the product and communicating to the people inside the business. The difference is, for a product manager, the customers, and they are customers because users get what they're given. Customers get to choose it, customers pay. Product managers, their customers are outside this building. By definition, they have to get out and meet customers and understand what they need. So there are three typical types of people you find filling the product owner role. And they can all feed into that requirement, just depends on your domain. Once upon a time, I used to say, your product owner, while they should be the person who really wants this product, and they're the person who's really passionate about it, and they're the person who's going to push it through, and that's kind of how Scrum describes it, they're more likely to be one of those three people because those people who really want the product and have the authority to push it through don't have the skills or the time to work with a development team day in, day out. And so you often get one of them in a mix even if they're helping one of those other product owner type people. So I used to say, your product owner has probably got a background as one of them. Today, I think that's changed. I think today, a product owner needs to have all three skill sets. They need to have some element of domain understanding, some element of ma subject matter. They need to be able to analyze businesses. They need to think about customers. Because the days where we had products that were only used in our corporation are shrinking fast. More and more of our corporations are exposing the IT systems to the outside world. Airlines are the best example. Go back 20 years. Did any of you ever interact with an airline system? No. You know, 20 years, maybe just, maybe you were just doing it. 25 years ago, no. You went to a travel agent, and a nice person behind a green screen interacted with the airline system and bought you a ticket. Now, whether you book on SAS or Ryanair or EasyJet or Lufthansa, may well have as much to do with the ease of using their system as it does with the flight schedules. In the airline industry, what was internal IT has now got an external dimension. The skill set's broadened. So once upon a time, you could fairly reasonably say a product owner was a subject matter expert or a business analyst or a product manager or some other specialist. Today, I think a product manager the market has decided a product owner is a subject matter expert and a business analyst and a product manager and something else. The degrees to which, which skills you need varies. There are four things I think every product owner needs. The first is the skills to do the job. Yeah, I, I don't just mean how to write a user story. For God's sake, um, you know, we can all learn to write a user story in an hour. Ten minutes is just about enough, actually. But, you know, there's a lot more skills. How do they know what to put on that card? How do they know what their customers really want? How do they know about craft crafting acceptance criteria? There's a lot of skills there. The second thing they need is the authority. At a very minimum, when a product owner walks into a sprint planning meeting, they need to be able to say, I want this, this, and that, and not be contradicted. You know, if a product owner is coming into a meeting and saying, oh, well, Fred wants this, and Jane wants that, and Bert wants that, you know, they, they, they haven't really got the authority. If a product owner is laying out what they want, and the next morning somebody else comes along and says, ignore them, do what I want, the product owner doesn't have authority, and the team's not going to work well like that. So the organization, needs to give the product owner some authority. They also need legitimacy. And legitimacy is different from authority. You can be given authority on a piece of paper, on an organizational chart. Legitimacy is other people, your peers, your development team, they need to see you as the right person to be making those decisions. Because while you may have the authority to nominate what work needs to be done, if people don't respect you as the right person to do that, they're going to undermine you. It, 
consciously or subconsciously. And you see this when an organization imposes a product owner on a team and the team reject that product owner. They don't know that product owner. They don't respect that product owner. They don't really want to do what the product owner is asking. And conversely, you see when um, a product owner emerges from a team, you've got like five developers and one of them just kind of steps up to the product owner role. The team may respect that, but the organization, even if it puts them on an organizational chart, other people in the organization may not see them as the right person, as the legitimate person to make them. He used to be a developer and now he's a product owner. All his decisions are based on the architecture, not on the, yeah? So they're different legitimacy and authority, but without either of them, you end up with the same, same effect. You can't really make decisions. People are undermining you. And finally, the most difficult one, time. There are so many things a product owner needs to do. It's not just about going to morning meetings, going to planning meetings, uh, reviewing the backlog, writing acceptance criteria, uh, going to retrospectives, etc., etc., which is all laid out in the Scrum book. The question you need to ask is, how do they know what to say in those meetings? How do they know what user stories to write? They don't know it because they've got a super big brain. They might know it because somebody's telling them what to write, in which case they're a product owner who doesn't have much of their own authority. To do the job properly, they need to be talking to customers and users and talking about the needs and analyzing it and thinking about it and comparing that with other requests and that takes time. Years ago, I was a product owner for a company in London. And if I wanted to see a customer, that could mean getting on a plane to Helsinki or getting on a plane to Chicago in one case. You know, getting a couple of hours to talk to a customer about what they need from our product could take several days. And then you've got to think about what they've said and you've got to marry that up with all the other comments and suggestions you're getting. So product owners need these four things. I think for each one of them, there's problems. I'm going to talk a bit more about skills and time. We haven't got enough time to delve into those two. So let's think about the skills a product owner needs. Um, at a very base level, you need the Scrum product owner skills. You need to understand Scrum. You need to understand Agile. You need to write user stories. You need to attend meetings, blah, 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 blah. You can learn most of that on a product owner course, certified product owner. Um, I've been through some certified product owner courses, and this is the kind of thing that I found. Scrum and Agile values, epics and stories, defining a backlog, writing user stories, prioritizing user stories, estimation, estimation. Interesting, isn't it? Who estimates the work? The product owners or the devs? Prog plan a project. Some of the um, PO courses I looked at actually talk about project management skills. So that's what you learn on a product owner course and some other stuff. But is that enough? Maybe necessary. I don't think it's enough. I think. You need to do your homework. You need to understand what's needed. You need the skills of a subject matter expert. And if, if, you, if you aren't a subject matter expert, you need the skills of being able to learn a lot of that stuff as quickly as possible. And you need the skills of a business analyst to think about how this will change your company and your business processes and how your company will recognize value from this. And since so many products now have an external dimension, you need the skills of a product manager. You need to be getting out there and meeting customers. You need to know how to interview customers. You need to, you need to be able to observe customers. And perhaps you need some UX skills and you need some, yeah. You also need some market analysis skills and some competitor analysis skills. And there's quite a few skills we need to put on here. And we're not done yet. Because while a product owner is not a project manager, they are about the what, not the when, you still need some project management skills. You are going to be asked questions about the when. Some product owners, unfortunately, are a little bit more than backlog administrators. They don't really understand the what. They just kind of. They write everything down they asked for, put it in a backlog, and then administer its doing. 
and they become very underpowered backlog administrators. I think that makes their life really difficult because they can't trade off. They just, they're just doing everything they're asked for. So I'm going to add in some delivery skills here, but I don't want you doing too much delivery type work. And then there are people who say the product owner is an entrepreneur. Have you heard that? No? Okay. There's lots of blogs about this. There's lots of people out there saying the product owner is an entrepreneur because they are evangelizing the product and they may even be selling the product and they're getting out there and they're telling people why it's so wonderful and they are thinking like an entrepreneur and they're thinking about the problems they'll solve and they're, oh, cool. Uh, which entrepreneur are you thinking of? In England, if you ask people to think of an entrepreneur, they probably think of this man. Yeah. Um, he does have the merit that an awful lot of his businesses have failed. He is very good at pivoting and he is very good at walking away from things. Um, getting on a bit now, so I'm not sure how active he is in a genuine entrepreneurship. He, he's one model for an entrepreneur. So is this man. He's an entrepreneur at the moment, isn't he? You know he's terrible at meeting deadlines. He's even in trouble with the FEC for talking about uh, the federal... Um, the American federal uh, regulator for markets and stock markets and things, because he talks about delivering timelines for Tesla and timelines for SpaceX and promises massive returns and shipping thousands of cars and never meets his own deadlines. Um, but you know, he's out there, he's ambitious, he's doing stuff, that's great. So maybe they're your role models and entrepreneur. Or maybe your role models and entrepreneur is the world's most successful entrepreneur. You're telling me he's not the world's most successful entrepreneur? You're not going to tell me they inherited lots of money from his dad. And you're not going to tell me that if he put all his money into the stock market, he'd have made more money? No, you're not going to tell me that, even if it's true. Uh, so people talk about the product owners as entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs are very demanding people. Do your developers want a really demanding person who doesn't take no, who is pers persistence is good, but they can go too far? I'm not sure what attributes of entrepreneur we want or we don't want, but people talk about the product owner as an entrepreneur. So we'll add in those skills. Uh, and we should probably add in some business and marketing skills and some personal skills and some facilitation skills. And uh, what else? What have I missed? What else do you want the product owner to have? Technical architecture. Oh, that's a good one. I might not agree with you, but I'll, I'll put it on the potential list. Uh, uh, pardon? UX. UX, yeah, there's another one I might argue with, but I'm happy to put it on the list. UX, a lot, a lot of product owners end up having to do UX. Questionable whether they're the best people to do it, but they end up having to do it. Yeah. A any other suggestions? Mind reader. Mind reader, yes. Telepathy would solve so many problems, wouldn't it? The list could go on. Uh, you know, we want a superhero, don't we? Do, do, how, where do we find these product owners? Do, are these people hanging around every street corner in Sweden? Are you blessed with people with all these skills? I know we aren't in London. They maybe all left for Malmo. Uh, yeah, is, this, is this too much to expect from one person? Scrum's quite clear, one person. You know, we can take away some of those skills, but not many of them. Yeah. Do um, do our companies support these people? Given that these are superheroes, do they earn a superhero salary? A product owners in the room, do you earn a superhero salary? But part of me wonders if 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 all the superhero um, product owners and product managers actually live within 30 miles of Palo Alto. You know, because that's where they do get the big salaries. Um, you know, do we support them? Do we train them? Um, where do we find them? You know, the recruitment standards must be amazing. Are we expecting too much? Is this too much from a product owner? From one person? I've, I don't know. I do see lots of product owners, and you think, they could do with better interpersonal skills. They could do with better business analysis skills. They could do with better this or that. Um, time, I must check time myself because I've got to keep to a deadline myself. Um, probably going to need time. 
time to talk to customers. It's difficult enough to find time to talk to people inside your organization when it's going to take you half a day to travel to your customer, talk to them, and half a day to come back. That's very time consuming. And that's time away from the team. That's time away from whatever they're doing in a sprint. If the customer can only meet you on a day when it's a sprint planning, that could be a problem. Product owners need to understand customer needs. And that's not just asking a customer briefly, what do you need, what do you want, but it's actually understanding it deeply. You know the, the old quote that gets, that's brought out again and again about Henry Ford? If I asked people what they wanted, they'd have said a faster horse. So product owners talk to customers and they say, I want a faster horse. Product owners got to process that. What are they actually asking for? They're asking for more rapid transport. They want to get from here to there more rapidly. They've got to make sense of it, and that takes time. Um, you've got other stakeholders inside your organization and outside, regulators, for example, and they have needs, they have demands, they have constraints. And of course, you need to do all the scrum ceremonies. And you need to write all the user stories. And you need to work with coders and testers, because the most important thing about a user story is to placeholder for a conversation. Thank you very much. Yeah? If you just write user stories and throw them over the wall, not going to work. Um, and um, you need to maintain the business case and understand the market. Um, and you need to forecast completion dates sometime. And um, you probably need to report upwards and to your peers. And you probably, oh, you've got a family too. I believe in Sweden, that's important. Uh, where are the hours in a day? Because th there's another secret about product owners, and CEOs have the same problem. They have the same 24 hours in a day as you and me. You don't get more time just because you're promoted to the corner office or because you're designated a product owner. Is there enough time to do all this? Help! Okay. So this is the point where, having presented some of the problems, I try and propose some solutions. Uh, as I say, this is as much a question from me to you. You, you. you tell me what really good product owners are doing. You, you tell me where I'm wrong in my analysis. Um, the skills bit is the easy bit. Skills bit, you can simply spend money and send people on courses. Of course, that takes time as well, which is a bit of a problem. But, you know, skills, you know, if you take the time to go and, you know, talk to subject matter experts, learn from them, if you take time to go on the analysis courses or whatever, you can, they are skills you can learn. By definition, skills are learnable. There are things that are not learnable, but skills are. But you need to take the time and you need to pay the money. How many of you work at companies where if you go back into the office on Monday and say, I want to book myself on a course, I'll be out of the office for two days next week, it's all cool, you just do it? Okay, maybe a quarter of you. Most of the companies I've ever worked for, you, the moment you say I want to go on a course, you end up in a bit of a firefight trying to persuade somebody that we really should spend the money and I really should be allowed time out of the office. Maybe that's just England. Maybe that's why our productivity is down. It can take a lot of time and effort to just go on a course. Um, time is actually the hardest thing to fix because I can't magic up, despite my time machine this morning, I can't magic up more time. What we have to think about is what can product owners stop doing? What do product owners do that really they should be leaving other people to do? Um, the first thing is I want you to stop coding. I actually think coding is incompatible with being a product owner. I accept some people do it, but I think the value you add as a product owner is not what you build yourself. It is in your selection of items to be built. And if you have an hour, you could spend an hour coding up something and adding value. Or you could spend an hour really analyzing what's in your backlog and validating that the thing you think is worth the most is worth what it is and thinking about how you get more value out of that item. And if, as a product owner, your mind is conflicted, should I be coding or should I be thinking of users and customers and backlogs and value and all of that? And if you're choosing the coding, then you're neglecting the other side of things. And I have another problem. Really great coders 
and I like to think I was one once upon a time. Really great coders empathize with the code. The code speaks to you. You feel the code's pain. Refactor me. Refactor me. Fix the bug. Yes. As a product owner, your job is not to empathize with the code. Your job is to empathize and feel with your customers and users. Your mind needs to be thinking like your customers and users. You need to be feeling your customers' pain. And if inside your one head, and I don't think Zafo Beaverbox is here today, inside your one head, your brain is conflicted, part of you is trying to think like a coder, and part of you is trying to think like a user, one side is going to win. And if you used to be a coder, and if you're any good at coding, it's going to be the coding side. And if you didn't used to be a coder, and you aren't a coder, please don't try it. You actually want somebody representing the technical side and somebody representing the user side to have a conversation. It's in the conversation that you can air the issues and you can talk about what you should do. If you try and put them into one head, well, I think we should refactor the system. No, the customers really want this. No, it really needs refactoring. No, we're going to have to do the customer value. You're going to end up in a mental hospital before long. You can't do it. You need someone to argue with. Product owners, please stop coding. Your job as a product owner is to extract value from the things the, co the coders do. Make sure you're feeding in high-value work and trust your coders to do it. And if you can't do it, just go back to coding. Coding is a very respectable profession. One of the other problems we have in Agile is having removed all the managers, we still need career progression. So the only two roles left to move up the career hierarchy are Scrum Master and Product Owner. You are the managers of last resort. Coding's very respectable, and it probably pays better. Stick with it if your heart is there. So please don't code, product owners. And please don't line manage teams. OK, I can accept that as an experienced product owner, you might have managerial responsibility for more junior product owners, right? I can get that. But I do not want you line managing the developers of the product you are building. Again. It's not a useful use of your time. Doing performance reviews, awarding grades, awarding pay rises, signing off holiday, you should be spending your time with your customers and your users. That admin stuff isn't for you. And it also distorts the relationship. Because remember, you're a self-organizing team. You just happen to be able to tell other people what to do. If you're line managing them, you've got even more power. So every time you say, you don't really mean two days in that estimate, do you? You're really distorting the estimates. You're not letting your team really have their say because you have extra power over them. It's far from being a self-organizing team. So get away from it. And it's just not a good use of your time. Um, being amateur UX designers. Okay? Um, I'm getting sick and fed up of meeting companies who tell me that the next product is going to be great on UX and their market advantage in the market is going to be the UXD and they are going to be the next Apple. And you say, right, where are your UX designers? Oh, we can't afford to hire any UX designers, but the product owner is pretty good at it. At least that's an improvement over the developers where know where to put the OK button. Yeah. Um, on a small team, particularly inside a corporation where you don't have customers who have choices, it may be acceptable for a product owner to slap user interfaces together. Again, it's reality. It's not the best use of their time. I'd rather you didn't do it. But if you as product owner decide that the killer feature, the killer thing about your product is going to be really slick, really cool UXD, then don't skimp. Spend the money. Don't try and do it yourself as a pet project. Fire one of your developers and spend that money on a proper UXD. Right? Because if UXD is your killer feature, you don't need so many features. Get rid of one developer and replace them. Even better still, get some more money. 
Stop writing documents. They don't work anyway. We, we still get people who write requirements documents. Um, they never work particularly well, so don't waste your time. You spend a lot of time editing them, and nobody really reads them. And if they do, they, they, they don't remember. Um, the other thing is get help. Yeah. Um, if you're in a situation where your product does ooh, time, if your product does have an external market, then get a proper product marketing person to do the advertising, the PR, the conferences, all that. You'll get dragged into some of it anyway, but you can offload that to specialists. Hire a UXD designer. If you're the type of product owner that gets dragged into pre-sales calls, get yourself a pre-sales consultant. Don't go out and become part of the sales team, telling people the technical aspects. Um, if you've got a project manager, development manager, scrum master, or some other type of managerial type, work with them, use them, um, and use the team. Although coders may emphasize with the code, they can still talk to users, you can still get them involved, you can still take them on chips, you can still help them analyze what's come in, and it's probably better for them if they are involved in more understanding of customers. Don't feel as if you need to keep all the customers to yourself. Share them, share that knowledge. The, uh, the last thing is, despite what Scrum says, I think we can refactor the model. And I think we can split it into what I tend to call strategic product owner and tactical product owner. And I have deliberately not drawn these as one superior to another. They are peers. One person gets out and meets lots of customers. Their primary job is outside the office. They work less with the development team inside the office. They are thinking later this year. They are thinking next year. They are thinking five years out. They're getting involved in business product discussions around strategy. And the tactical product owner, they spend more of their time working with the development team in planning meetings, scrum meetings, whatever. They meet customers, they just do it less. And they are thinking near term, this sprint, the next sprint, the next few sprints. Lots of companies have discovered this model although they don't know that it's a model, and they don't know that lots of other companies use it. You often see these as product manager, business analyst, or product manager, product owner, which is a really bad way of doing it, because owners should always be superior to managers. Managers are higher guns. Owners actually own the thing. Um, this model reoccurs again and again, but everyone thinks they've invented it. I like the title strategic and tactical, but I don't care what you call them. But it's a way of sharing the workload. The two of them need to agree amongst themselves where the responsibilities fall. And ideally, they can deputize for each other. So if one is off on holiday, the other one can stand in, and vice versa. Uh, most importantly, they speak with one voice these two people to talk and ask for the same things. If they disagree, it's a recipe for disaster. They speak with one voice. If they're going to need to debate something, they debate it amongst themselves. They don't debate it in front of the team. And finally, don't let yourself become a dog's body. This is another common problem with product owners, and another one that saps their time, is there's all this stuff that needs doing, Typically, what used to be done by managers, but there aren't any managers anymore, but there's things that still need doing, and so who's going to do them? And the last person standing is the product owner. Uh, you know, so they end up picking up everything that's left over, and we become a bit of a dog's body. Avoid that. You know, offload the work, or don't do it, pass it on to somebody else, or just tell people you're not going to get it. Be very clear about what your role is on the team. And your role as a product owner is not to do the things nobody else wants to do. Your job is to ensure that the product that is being delivered is the most valuable product possible, both for examining the requests that are coming in, the ideas that are coming in, working out where the value is, and when things are delivered, making sure they deliver the value you wanted.
just one minute over. Thank you very much. Where's the next presenter? I can take questions so they come up and throw me out. <laughs> Thank you.